And running a node today is the easiest it has ever been. Like the conversation two years ago revolved around trying to build or trying to run Linux on some old laptop and also running Bitcoin Core on that laptop. But I think with the development of ARM-based devices like the Raspberry Pi, which are very powerful, nowadays we have such an easy way for about $200. You can be your own bank and also benefit from all the privacy and all the sovereignty and all the censorship resistance of banks. And that's very important. And that's the only way in which Bitcoin can help us prevent the Alex Jones and other financial censorship situations. Otherwise, if you rely on custodians and believe that just because they have a good record, they're going to be incorruptible and they're going to keep on doing good stuff for Bitcoin, that's just wishful thinking. That's what I like to call hopium. You should not trust anyone with any of this stuff. It's your money. That's the whole point of the Bitcoin network to make you sovereign and put you in charge of your own money. If you can't handle that, I can understand that there might be custodians, but at least there should be the kind of education which makes you understand why you should run your own node and why you should be a first class citizen of the network. We just interviewed Giacomo Zucco about token issuance and smart contracts on Bitcoin uh, with his RGB network. And RSK is also taking a different approach, but it's in the similar effort to bring uh, token issuance and smart contracts to Bitcoin. What are your thoughts on tokens on Bitcoin, colored coins, and smart contracts? Yeah, so to me, that's the ultimate maximalist thesis. Because on one hand, you have the maximalists who say that Bitcoin is perfect as it is, and it should only receive minor refinements like Taproot or something. And we should not integrate shitcoin stuff in it. And shitcoins will die just because they are more centralized and they don't have the same immaculate conception. And then there is the other side of maximalism, which considers that you should maximize the kind of stuff that revolves around Bitcoin and you should build everything on top of it with layers because it's the most secure network and it has the best money that we have, the best decentralized money. And I tend to side with the second kind of category. And I think that it's useful to have side chains which provide a trade-off between security because obviously nothing is going to be as robust as the base layer of Bitcoin. But you're going to have a greater advantage in terms of maybe tokens, maybe more privacy with something like Monero or Zcash being a side chain of Bitcoin. And you can also have smart contracts, RSK, that's what it does. And I guess also drive chains, which are trying to also build big block side chains so that you can do on-chain transactions with low fees and a lot of scalability and someone is going to actually mine that chain. So to me, it's very interesting. Also the Lightning Network of which BitRefill is a huge fan. And I know that BitRefill was the first company to open a one BTC channel and then it kept on improving. And I think right now, I think you got to 10 BTC, the largest channel, and that's really impressive. It just proves that the company, BitRefill, really believes in Lightning as a second layer and as a payment mechanism. So I believe that the layers of Bitcoin are some of the most exciting and interesting parts. And what Giacomo Zucco is doing, as far as I know, it's tokenization on top of Lightning. I think he, he's still working on the RGB project. He was working on it two years ago when I was interviewing him. I haven't heard much about the project since, but I can only assume that it has evolved and gotten better. And it's really cool because it has client-side validation so that every participant to the network doesn't have to store everyone else's transactions and everyone else's operations. You store your own and interact with the network in this way. And it's on top of the Lightning Network, which is very decentralized nowadays. And I'm very proud to participate in the decentralization of Lightning. And I think it's one of the most noble activities that you can do today in Bitcoin to help the Lightning Network expand. And it can also get selfish because once you open a lot of channels, you're going to route somebody else's transactions. So you collect fees. So in the long term, it can make you rich, but you don't have great expectations for it, unless you're willing to put a lot of money. But 
I really like this kind of stuff. I like RSK. I like RGB. I'm not saying that it's degenerate altcoin, whatever. I think that if there's a market for it and there are people willing to do it and it doesn't affect the security of the base layer and it's going to bring more people to the base layer of Bitcoin because in order to get to layer three, you actually need to get the underlying asset and take every step towards there. I'm happy about it. And I'm, I've actually had a conversation with Joshua Shigala from Voltoro, and he wants to tokenize gold because he believes that the fact that you have about $12 trillion in gold sitting in vaults is actually kind of bad and you should be able to transact it more easily. So he's interested in tokenizing his own gold vaults and basically allowing users to change ownership a lot faster. And he took a look into it and he could theoretically do it on top of the Lightning Network. And he actually tried to do it with V Gold or something. That was two years ago, but it did not get traction because Lightning was not big enough. And today when there's another, another bull market, he had to do it on Ethereum just because there are more users on Ethereum and it's a lot easier to deploy code on it. And there's a larger community of developers and stuff like that. So. To him, it was easier, but he believes that it, he should be able to return to Bitcoin and build something on a layer of, or something like a side chain or something on top of Lightning. And we should get there. That's what I think. Or else we're, we will only allow shit coins to exist. And they are shit coins, but it doesn't mean that they don't do something interesting or useful that can be adopted by Bitcoin in a layer. So glad, um, interesting um, assets so far, really a um, lot to unpack there. So what are your thoughts on the Bitcoin um, law in El Salvador where merchants are kind of like a coin, you know, if the customer does have Bitcoins offered, do you think um, it, by the fact that it takes away the element of choice merchants, do you think, you know, it's all the means to an end, which the end in this case being the adoption of Bitcoin? I'm happy that you asked me this question, Jerry, because I, I've spoken about it on the podcast quite a lot, but I'm going to present the argument to another audience also right now. And this goes back to the argument of being forced to be free. Like, can anyone step into your house and tell you from now on, you're going to adopt this currency and it will set you free, but you're going to accept my authority and you're going to take my word for it. And you, you don't know yet why this is a good idea, but you have to trust me that I'm going to do the right thing for you. And a lot of people conclude in this situation that if it's for a good cause, then you should give up on your freedom and it should no longer be your free will. But I tend to think that Bitcoin adoption should not happen from the top. You should not have a politician telling you from now on you're going to use Bitcoin. If anything, I think that this project relies on individual contributions and is a projection of the libertarian and voluntarist side of the society. And we like to build stuff from grounds up, not take stuff from above and believe that there's going to be some sort of authority who's going to take care of us, who's going to be nice to us. And even though I can understand that some citizens in El Salvador are going to own some Bitcoin, I still have questions about how they're going to own it. Because as far as I know, the government is going to give them some amount and is going to give them the alternative to choose the wallet. But is it really a choice when the government has a wallet of their own, which is custodial? And then there's Tripe, which also has a custodial wallet and got the most attention. And then the president tells you, yeah, so I have developed with my team this wallet. And there's this friend of mine who has that wallet, they're custodial, but if you don't like it, you can download any wallet on your phone and get your money. But in reality, a lot of people don't really have a choice because they don't understand why there is a choice. So if you don't know why you should choose, you're gonna go for the most convenient situation. And with El Salvador, I've also asked this question. If the users can choose between receiving their funds in a wallet, which charges them no fees, but is custodial or another one, which is totally free open source and puts you in charge and sovereign and everything else connects your full node and makes you a true first-class citizen of the Bitcoin network, but charges fees. 
if you are a disinformed or a newbie who has no idea what, what's going on and why this is happening, are you really going to choose the sovereign way? And I tend to think that the answer is no, because people are going to follow the, their best economic interest without caring much about their privacy or their sovereignty or about unconfiscatability of their money. And this is why I think that we need a lot of education. We need a lot of podcasts. We need a lot of articles. We need a lot of magazines. We just need to spread the knowledge and not just in English, but in every language that we can speak and to anyone who is interested. And I don't believe that we should force anyone. There is a point in anyone's life when they start asking questions about their money, about their lives, about their finances, about their future. And that's when they will make sense out of it all. If they never ask questions, they're never going to take your answers. And while I agree that there are some people who only follow what the government tells them and therefore will only adopt Bitcoin when the government does it for them, I still don't think it's the right, it's the right way just because it goes against my system of beliefs. And I'm going to act personally so that I can help as many people get educated and understand how to be sovereign and be completely free as opposed to accepting that someone is going to be their liberator and master. I guess the, the El Salvador topic has been a little bit divisive uh, on, on Twitter and I think in general, because I think a lot of people have different, different, differing philosophies, right? Like there's people who kind of have that uh, feeling of like the means justify the ends or whatever. So, um, but yeah, I can definitely understand your, uh, your outlook or your view on it and like why you feel that way about the, uh, the El Salvador law. It's something that sits a little bit iffy with me. It's kind of exciting that a country is adopting Bitcoin, but it's also kind of a bit like, uh, it's kind of being forced. And <laughs> as you say, it might be in the wrong fashion that it's occurring. Um, I guess um, something that's a little bit uh, different in a topic, but um, when it comes to because when it comes to online as well, like I see a lot of people very often talking about like hodling, like stacking sats, holding onto sats, like holding onto Bitcoin, not spending it, not you know, essentially just trying to accumulate as much as possible. Um, and I I wonder like what your sort of like advice is to people who are new or your perception of this is because for me like buying and holding on to bitcoin and that's it and never actually spending it or trying to do anything earning it whatever it kind of just doesn't really help all that much to me anyway like, and i feel like the circular economy is pretty important and i know that kind of goes along with bit refills uh philosophy probably too but uh but that is my personal philosophy um for various reasons that i'll probably tell you after after you've spoken but i just wanted to get your your views on that like are you kind of someone who strictly huddle spend quite a lot or kind of like try to balance it maybe you know give advice to your friends to kind of try to balance that what what, what kind of advice do you give and how do you see things uh, i don't think i'm in any position to tell people what to do with their own money so it's your money it's your life i don't have your experiences i don't have your expectations i'm not living in your specific situation it's money it you should be using it however you want if you think that it's going to become more precious in time and you can afford to huddle it, then go ahead and huddle it. But if you need to, I don't know, undergo some sort of surgery to help a family member who maybe uh, goes through a terrible accident or something like that, and you have to choose between huddling and saving the life of someone who is dear to you, obviously there is nothing more precious in this world than your own life or somebody else's that you hold dear. and. I presented this example only because a couple of weeks ago, we have seen the news of Mit Chapopescu, who was a big Bitcoiner and the Romanian whale. At some point, he allegedly owned about 1 million Bitcoin. And it is believed that he held about 100,000 or more at the time when he died. And it's really unfortunate to know that, for example, his body was found in Costa Rica and no family member claimed it. He, I don't think he allowed the Bitcoins to be inherited by anyone. I'm fairly sure that they were lost forever. And it's just sad to think that he was 41. He had most likely about 30 more years of ahead of him or more. And he had all the money in the world. He huddled so hard, but did not get to enjoy life in any way. 
And it really makes you wonder what your priorities are. And there really is no definitive answer for this. We, all of us, we expose ourselves to risks and we have different lives and we have a, to adjust to different conditions. So if you want to spend your money on something, go ahead and do it, but make sure my only advice is to think in terms of producing value. And if you think that the way that you spend your money is going to help you produce more value. If you buy a house and it's going to help you become more independent and it's going to help you start a new life, I think that's a very noble cause. And the fact that you don't hold on to your Bitcoins for 10 more years and choose to be independent 10 years earlier, I think that's a good cause. Buying unnecessary stuff like Lambos and stuff like that. I mean, it's not up to me to say it's unnecessary. It's just that I think it's too much and nobody really needs a Lambo. There are some basic human needs that you can fulfill with your money and you should be fulfilling. I don't think Lambos are part of that or Teslas just to flex that Elon Musk has enabled payments for a couple of weeks to buy Teslas. So yeah, it's your money. You do whatever. I don't think an economy can actually function if everyone hoards it. And I, I think that most people on Twitter who brag about never selling are most likely LARPing and they are trying to build that sense of confidence within the community that everyone believes in the long-term success of the project. Because you see the same people going to conferences and driving expensive cars and wearing fancy clothes and paying for the drinks of everyone else around. And it makes you wonder how do they make so much money that they can buy so much Bitcoin, huddle it, and also live a life that's maybe not luxurious, but you know, not really frugal either. And I'm pretty sure that many people who claim that they never sold any BTC actually did. I suppose like I guess um I think my my concern is always that like I see things like uh, for example KYC uh, as a bit of a threat. Uh, for example, if a government wanted to stop people in in a country from owning or buying or selling Bitcoin, an easy way is to essentially try and block it at the point of exchange to fiat currencies. Um, and like I guess the the easy defense to that is if we have a fairly robust circular economy built, or a person manages to build up a bit of a sort of feeling where they're earning on Bitcoin and spending in Bitcoin and holding Bitcoin, then I feel like that's kind of like a really good natural defense to that threat because it's like, well, sure, block me from, you know, transferring my British pounds into Bitcoin. I don't give a damn because I'm already earning in it. I'm spending in it. I'm paying my rent in it, if you get what I mean. So that's why I guess I think I get a bit frustrated at times with the the people on Twitter constantly saying hodl, hodl or, or whatever, or they call me an, an idiot for like having bought something I needed to get once with Bitcoin when I only had Bitcoin. <laughs> I didn't have pounds, you know, like it was just a little bit silly um, to me. But I guess that's kind of where I was getting was that I think that building the circular economy is extremely important for that very, I think it adds more security essentially to the world of Bitcoin. You know, most people who got into Bitcoin in 2010, 2011, up to 2013, were mostly using Bitcoin as a way to not use fiat money. So to them, it was a way to opt out from the fiat economy. And then there was this whole movement which started saying, you know, you should be huddling onto your Bitcoin and not spending it. I think it's rooted in Gresham's law, which says that good money drives out the bad. So you should be spending the bad money first and leave the good money for savings, which makes sense. But at the same time, it depends on why you need to spend money and what you're trying to accomplish. If you want to be a sovereign individual, you should be spending your Bitcoins. If you want to afford to be unbanked in this world, then you should be spending your Bitcoins at various places or go to ATMs and get cash. I, I, unlike a lot of Bitcoiners, I like to think that we are going to need cash like always, and I don't see it going away because it's so useful. It's the most private form of money. Locally, when you go to somebody, you just hand them a piece of paper, they acknowledge that it has value, and they give you their goods or services in exchange. It's the most efficient, fastest, internet proof, and I don't know, atomic nuclear attack, meteor strike, or solar flare proof kind of payment. And not only this, but 
I'm actually developing and thinking about ways in which you can use Bitcoin as cash. So you can issue banknotes that have some sort of cryptographic proofs and also allow you to verify that there is somewhere in an account, there's a corresponding amount of Bitcoin, which backs the amount written on the piece of paper. And it also proves that it's unique and it was not replicated. So yeah, that's where I'm at nowadays. I think a lot about cash and how we can actually make transactions off the chain, off the record, off the internet with Bitcoin that are stored most likely in my idea there, they are stored by a custodian. So for example, let's say that BitRefill issues banknotes worth of 10 BTC and there's going to be 0.01 Bitcoin on each banknote. So that means it's going to be 10,000 banknotes that can be used all across the world. And if somebody wants to exchange that banknote for their Bitcoin, they just go to BitRefill and they give it back to BitRefill and they receive the corresponding amount of Bitcoin, just like banknotes used to be backed by gold in the early days. But the difference is that nowadays we have many more cryptographic proofs to help you not get fooled like you are getting in the early days of banking and in the later days of fiat of the fiat system where you ended up having unnecessary and abusive inflation. So I'm not sure if you agree with me, but we can actually make Bitcoin work as cash. And I think it's a good cause. I think it's like a pretty uh, ambitious idea, but like, hey, I, I don't necessarily think I disagree nor agree at the moment. Um, but I remember years and years and years ago, uh, talked to my grandfather before I, I think I even knew what Bitcoin was about like the danger of society losing cash for that privacy aspect. And my concern about like just having a number on the screen that the government could essentially, or a bank could just go boop, boop, and just delete, you know, that was a big concern of mine 2010 or whatever, 20, 2009, when I had never heard of Bitcoin. So uh, I think it's a, it's an interesting idea. I'd like to see you give it a go. That's for certain. There's actually a guy whose name is Damien Lerner, and he's the co-founder of the RSK sidechain. And he has developed a money system which doesn't rely on a central issuer and is actually backed by Bitcoin. So basically, he created a system of Bitcoin banknotes that you can use an issue in a way that can be transacted physically, locally, and without any sort of custodian. I'm not sure how it works, but he is a cryptographer, which I'm not. And he might know a little more about it. And I can tell you that Peter Todd, who used to be a Bitcoin developer, a Bitcoin core developer, is also a fan of this idea. And also Charlie Lee, I think, when I started thinking about it once again, because this has, has been on my mind for a few years, but I when I started thinking about it recently, it was because of a tweet by Charlie Lee about El Salvador. And he said that now El Salvador is going to need cash that's backed by Bitcoin. And he was made fun of by some people and was like, ah, ha, ha, paper money. That's what Bitcoin is supposed to replace. But it's not really paper money. It's the underlying asset that's trying to replace. So we might even end up having all of the services that fiat money is having today, like Patreon, but backed by Bitcoins. I think Patreon is like a layer four of the fiat system because you have the monetary supply and then you have banks and then you have payments processors like PayPal. And on top of them, you have donation services like GoFundMe and Patreon and stuff like that. I think we can also have something similar with Bitcoin, but it's going to happen with the kind of money that can be verified and whose supply you know and has a very transparent monetary policy. And the point, in my opinion, is not to replace entirely the means, but the underlying asset. 